for sir. Um, sir, um, he is, so Mr. Vinay Thakur, he is COO, National E-Governance Division, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. And I'm going to request him to tell us more about the program, its progeny and future plans. Mr. Thakur is also holding the charge of additional director general, ADG, Bhaskaracharya National Institute for Space Applications and Geoinformatics, um, and has more than 25 years of experience in implementing IT and e-governance projects. Sir, over to you. Uh, yeah, very good morning and uh, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone, uh, all the speakers, our joint secretary, and CEO sir also was to join. I don't know uh, if he gets time, he will be joining in. So uh, uh, welcome, sir. Uh, uh, very thankful uh, to uh, CEO NEGD, who is also uh, he's CEO of NEGD and MD of Digital India Corporation for taking these type of initiatives. Not only one initiative, but uh, uh, we have started a number of initiatives related to, uh, uh, this one is related to AI, but we have started the training on cloud. We have started uh, other trainings related to e-governance and other them thematic areas like GIS, cybersecurity and others. So thank you so much, sir, for guiding us and uh, uh, always supporting uh, the initiatives. Uh, uh, would like to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Saurav Gore, uh, Joint Secretary in the Ministry, who is uh, not only leading uh, uh, this emerging technology portfolio, vertical in the ministries, but uh, uh, is also very instrumental uh, in other electronic manufacturing policies of the government. Uh, uh, emerging Recording in progress. Emerging technologies, we are working on National Center, which she will be sharing with uh, we have started a number of programs out there, reaching out to each and every ministry, finding out their data sets and how they can be further used to refine their services. So thank you, sir, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, conference. And would like to uh, 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 thank Intel team, uh, 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 Sweta Khurana ma'am, Saloni, and all the people who have been there uh, for many years working with us, standing with us, and then taking all these type of initiatives and then taking them forward uh, to see to it that we are able to uh, create uh, not only the manpower related to AI, but also working uh, with us on other number of program uh, where we are creating a lot of uh, uh, and, uh, mentorships, a lot of knowledge around school kids, uh, on AI and other uh, uh, related, uh, we started with cyber hygiene program, cyber wellness to start with uh, 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 earlier. So uh, thank you so much, the team Intel. Uh, AI has been very, very crucial uh, 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 to address the societal issue. And today's uh, program of AI in social good is uh, also in that direction. Uh, 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 it is uh, with AI probably we can approach the problem which uh, is coming to the people and then meaningfully uh, explore and then improve uh, people's life. Uh, it can, uh, uh, it is rather, it is to help and explore and address a you know, lot of unanswered queries even while we are working uh, in number of programs with the ministries, we have big, big data sets. Uh, but then the data sets and that those systems are only uh, providing uh, the basic services to the citizens. So probably uh, while we use AI, it is going to uh, be solving a lot more problems. Uh, it is going to improve the services being delivered uh, to the citizen of the country. So we are looking for uh, uh, using AI and today's session is going to be very, very crucial uh, to see to it that AI is... Uh, being uh, uh, used and AI should be used in disaster management. E AI should be used in handling the diseases, uh, tracking the diseases, monitoring uh, and predicting uh, the disease spread probably what we have seen during COVID. So in many places and many companies and even within the government also the use of AI was done. And uh, also to see uh, other social and environmental uh, uh, systems uh, where AI can be used and then 
it can help us in managing uh, these uh, things better. Uh, even many companies within uh, India, uh, their 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 uh, branches, their offices in India, like Microsoft, Google, uh, and then government bodies are deploying AI-based solutions for social uh, initiatives. Vadwani uh, uh, during uh, during COVID, Vadwani AI, they started one initiative, uh, cuff against COVID, the taking various samples and seeing to it whether you are COVID. So these uh, using AI, so these type of uh, Ini initiatives are very, very crucial to see to us that we are able to use AI in much, much uh, better manner. And uh, uh, so with this, uh, probably I hope uh, that uh, today's interaction is going to be very, very beneficial. And with this, I again welcome uh, uh, Joint Secretary uh, Gaur, sir, and uh, even uh, my CEO would also like to join in sometime uh, Abhishek sir, the entire team of uh, Intel and all the speakers who uh, are there uh, today, uh, who are going to share their knowledge with all the participants. Uh, I welcome them again. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, back to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thanks so much for introducing um, Saurav, sir. And uh, sir, just for uh, everyone, I'll uh, give a brief introduction about you. Sir, you are a Joint Secretary Emerging Technologies at MITE, Government of India, and you also look after the National Strategy for AI, handling policies and programs and schemes of Government of India pertaining to electronics and hardware. Saurav, sir, very delighted and uh, request you to provide the opening remark and set the context for the session. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shweta, for your very kind, uh, Swati, I'm sorry, for your kind words and uh, uh, so uh, just for the benefit of everyone um, in ministry, while NEGD, the National E-Governance Division, works as an implementation arm of the agent of the ministry and is actively engaged in rolling out uh, solutions for AI and uh, effectively implementing the Digital India program, I work on the policy space uh, as a part of the program division, the way it is uh, mentioned or the way it is put uh, in the ministry's internal functioning. And I and my team are responsible for policy making around AI. So sitting in the vantage point that we do, we look at lots of these exciting solutions uh, coming up every day in different spaces of uh, uh, and, or, and different artifacts and uh, different sectors of uh, uh, government governance and also uh, sectors of the society also. I personally believe that uh, AI has the potential to tackle some of the world's most challenging social pro problems. And with its uh, present and existing capabilities also, it can contribute to tackling uh, all the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and bringing new efficiencies as we look at uh, helping hundreds of millions of people in both advanced as well as emerging countries. Uh, we need to manage this transition effectively by balancing ethical issues with the growth of the society. I believe the success of Digital India has set a new global benchmark for leveraging digital technologies for inclusive growth, uh, for good governance and empowerment of the society. Digital India, backed by AI, is the future of e-governance in India. And we look at as different public digital platforms and different digital missions get rolled out. New efficiencies are going to be brought in by plugging the AI-based solutions and other uh, foundational technologies that contribute to AI, such as blockchain uh, and uh, machine learning, compute, so on and so forth, uh, and allow solutions in these different artifacts of technology to get integrated with the digital missions. So while in, in government, we will be looking at AI uh, not just as a vertical, but as a horizontal, and not just bringing an incremental change, but a paradigm shift uh, that must be harnessed for humanity's well-being. So while uh, we see all these solutions coming up, is there really a need for government intervention? So one of the things that the government can do and which we are engaged in uh, doing this, ensuring that we can make safe and secure data available to the AI ecosystem data being the basic building block for uh, any AI system. And India, with its 700 million plus internet subscribers, uh, almost a billion plus phone users, uh, 
uh, 1.3 billion Aadhaar users. They, we generate massive amount of data daily. As per statistical average, uh, uh, statistical research, almost average Indian generates 13 GB of data per month. That is also because our data rates are among the cheapest in the world. So with so much of data being generated, how do we ensure availability of open source data uh, to the ecosystem? And uh, apart from regulatory restrictions on data, the other fact is that uh, the data annotation and uh, uh, data labeling are also very tedious processes, but these are essential for uh, useful data sets to be available. So taking all this into view, we have uh, the OpenGov data platform where we have almost 7 lakh, 700,000 data sets available. And these are shared at different frequencies and in different formats. And what we are doing is, again, uh, looking at this, this data very closely and ensuring AI readiness of that data and identifying the high value data sets among these uh, data, uh, data sets which are available and making them accessible through a secured pathway. We are looking at data reference data exchanges coming up one sector after the other. We already have, for example, in UPI, uh, the, there's a financial intermediary and the financial data exchange platform that has been set up, which has unearthed the power of uh, FinTech. And we have seen lots of solutions come around that. Similarly, we are looking at uh, National Digital Health Mission and at uh, United Health Interface, just like there was a United Payment Interface, a United Health Interface coming out. and uh, the data registries and data repositories being made available through the National Digital Health Mission, which allows lots of private system players to develop their UI based uh, solutions around that. There will be, or there are existing initiatives to different levels in education and agriculture with these platforms coming up. And similarly, we will see in the social welfare sector also, uh, uh, these uh, this kind of reference data exchanges come up and regulatory sandboxes being established for uh, people to be able to test their solutions and then to deploy them. I believe uh, apart from this, the other role that the government can play effectively is responding to the skilling needs of the people. I believe lots of uh, people from, uh, from the states and uh, government of India ministries are there, the data contributors, the data annotators, data custodians, they need to build their own uh, expertise and uh, skills around uh, artificial intelligence. We have established that MEMT teams, mission mode e-governance uh, teams, and uh, the earlier teams which are established were with a different kind of skill sets in project management, in creating RFPs and all, around traditional e-governance solutions procurement. Now we have to look at new capacities being injected into the teams so that they are able to understand the power of AI understand how data should be shared, understand how do we deploy data exchanges very effectively, and then have that data sharing framework available for the for private sector to contribute effectively. And these are things that we are trying to, uh, to do through the national program on AI. Uh, the, there is no national formal program on AI, but uh, presently uh, we have the different foundational pieces or uh, the different uh, verticals within the national program on AI, whether it is data for AI or scaling for AI, and also a very exciting financing for AI program that is going to get rolled out uh, very soon. And uh, I believe all of these things coming together should be able to, uh, to take India from its present 42nd position or 41st position in AI uh, uh, governance to among the top 10 countries in the near future. I uh, wish, uh, I see there are lots of exciting deliberations lined up for the day, and I wish uh, the organizers, the Digital India team, uh, uh, great sessions ahead, and I look forward to, me and my team also have joined, and we look forward to the deliberations today. Thank you, Swati. Saurav, sir, thank you so much. Um, now we are going to move on uh, to our next session, which is on AI and SDGs. And before that, I would like to uh, honor Rabi Sheikh, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, joining us. It's always a delight to have you here. And uh, with this, I will uh, move on to um, the next session, which is on AI and SDGs. Uh, herein, we learn about the role AI can play to accelerate achievement of SDGs. 
And to talk more about this, we have our distinguished speaker, Mr. Virapan Swami Nathan. Uh, he is founder and director of Sustainable Living Labs, and he's joining us from Singapore today. Uh, he's currently an executive member of the Climate Action SG Alliance and panel member of the Lotus NUS Fund. He is currently working on organizational sustainability transition, digital divide, e-waste, and active aging issues in more than a dozen countries. With this brief introduction, I welcome Mr. Swami Nathan, and over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Swati, for the introduction, and uh, good uh, afternoon, I believe. Rather, is it morning? All right. <laughs> to all of you. Still morning. Still morning, morning. still morning to all of you. Okay. So good morning to all of you, uh, distinguished uh, gentlemen, ladies, uh, and, and so friends, it's a pleasure to be invited to share. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. I believe you can uh, see it now. Yes, we can. All right, fantastic. Okay, so um, in my short presentation, short remarks today, I would like to introduce to you what the sustainable development goals uh, and also in relation to how AI can be used to achieve them. Um, so I will start briefly with what, what is AI? I mean. I'm sure uh, many of you might have heard of this term, uh, may even have spent some time uh, trying to understand it, or even taken the courses uh, offered, I believe, under uh, uh, Meti and so on, which allow you to uh, experience what AI is. So in short, it basically it enables machines to learn from experience with data and uh, perform certain uh, functions and so on. Right? So there are a couple of terms that intersect in this space uh, with artificial intelligence, which is a very, very broad term. Uh, then we have machine learning, which is a subset of that. Uh, and then we have uh, deep learning, which is a further subset of machine learning. Now, when you look at AI, you can see it either as a form of intelligence, uh, you can see it as a form of technology, or you can see it as a field of study. Uh, there are various uh, ways uh, one can look at it. Uh, so a lot of what we do today is actually narrow AI, meaning the AI focuses on doing a specific task and doing that very well. Uh, but what you see in the movies, in the cinema, is general AI. Right. It shows AI that can handle any sort of task, any sort of domain. We call that general intelligence. And now what's happening is that there's been a lot of development in this space in the last uh, decade. And the reason is largely because uh, the amount of data available has increased tremendously due to the internet. We are also getting uh, faster processing power from computers and machines. And also uh, we are finding you know, uh, new algorithms to be able to uh, efficiently, effectively uh, do the learning and training of data as well. Now, uh, as some of these uh, AI tools uh, become more popular, they become mainstream. So today, if you are watching uh, Netflix or, or Hulu or any of those um, online uh, video applications, uh, you basically are experiencing the power of AI as well uh, because it's recommending to you what you should watch next and so on based on a study or data of all your past viewing habits and patterns. So YouTube does that, Google does that. Um, so it's rather mainstream right now in many things that you use today. Uh, but of course, uh, it's largely used in a commercial setting for the most part. And I think in today our focus is looking at for sustainable development goals in particular, for development needs in particular, uh, how AI can be used uh, in that context. So AI can't do everything, uh, but AI can generally answer uh, these uh, five things. Now, the precondition, of course, is you need a clean data set. And a data set can either be numbers, numerical, it can be images, text, audio, and so on and so forth. Now, given that you have a clean data set and uh, it is organized, it is categorized as labeled, uh, you can generally do about five things. First is you can ask, how is the data organized? Uh, we call this clustering. Uh, next, you can also ask, is something A or B or X and Y? You can distinguish and differentiate between two or more items. We call this classification. Then uh, you can also uh, ask, you know, is there any sort of uh, anomaly, any sort of outlier? Uh, is this normal abnormal behavior? Uh, so this can be used to basically uh, predict uh, if patterns are holding or if there are something weird that's happening as well. Uh, then for the fourth one, you can basically ask, uh, you know, how much of something will happen in the future, right? So this is your standard regression analysis. And then the last thing is that uh, with reinforcement learning, you can even consider and ask, you know, what should I do next, given I have a certain set of circumstances, given that a certain uh, 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 
means of effecting change, uh, what should I do? What's the best course of action, right? So the reinforcement learning uh, are some methods that are used to achieve that. And uh, in most cases, the biggest problem in doing any AI project is first obtaining that data set, which is clean, which is organized. Uh, and in the case of SDGs, the challenge is often that in the development context, there is insufficient data. But the data that is not is collected is basically what they call dirty, meaning the data needs to be organized, clean. Uh, the answers need to be checked to make sure they're accurate uh, and so on. So the data is the biggest challenge. Uh, but of course, you know, many government agencies around the world, uh, I'm sure in India as well, collect lots and lots of data uh, and they're also digitizing it as well. Uh, so uh, assuming that the data can be clean, there's a lot that you can do with it. Now let me move the conversation over to Sustainable Development Goals or SDG for short as we call it. So the SDG is basically about 17 goals that has been uh, introduced by the United Nations and adopted by all member uh, countries or member states in 2015, 2015. So now it's been uh, six years uh, since that, that period. And these basically represent a sort of a template of what development needs should be prioritized and so on. Now, every country has their own approach towards which SDG areas they want to focus in and how they show this is by presenting a voluntary national report or called a BNR. So the Indian government basically presented its BNR in 2017 was one version. The second BNR report, I, uh, I believe, was done last year. And for the BNR report, there are essentially five areas that the Indian government uh, has put forward in the UN as their focus areas. Uh, so one is about, uh, and, and, I, and I will not uh, try to uh, uh, say the words, I'm not very good with Hindi, okay? <laughs> and, and, I, and I will avoid uh, pronouncing the words that way. Uh, but it's basically about empowerment and resilience, uh, about having a clean and healthy India, uh, creating inclusion, entrepreneurial activity, uh, making India sustainable uh, in terms of uh, environmental land, water use, and so on, and also bringing growth and prosperity uh, for all Indian people. Now, there are a couple of SDG projects that the Indian government uh, is key to achieving these things. And, and I think the, the main one that most of you are familiar with is the Digital India Initiative, which is actually a series of many, many projects. Uh, but our esteemed uh, uh, gentlemen who are leading Digital India are actually uh, in this call as well. So I, I, will, I will leave them uh, later to add the details on how they do that. Uh, but it's a remarkable program and it's uh, led by Ministry of Financial Choice and, and uh, Information Technology. But the basic idea is to you know, uh, bring ICT access uh, to build digital infrastructure and also to uh, deliver government services and develop the people by improving the digital literacy in an increasingly digital world. The uh, second project is the Make India project and this one is led by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and this is to encourage companies to manufacture in India and also incentivize uh, investments in the manufacturing. Uh, so it's a lot of policy related activities that they undertake uh, but also trying to make sure that the companies have access to the you know, uh, labor and talent required to be able to manufacture and also supply chains required to make that happen. Uh, then we have uh, Skill India, which is on the skilling side. And really, skill development here is used to lift up people, uh, mitigate poverty, and uh, achieve economic growth. And because India has a what we call a youth dividend, a very, very large youth population, uh, if done well, skill development has a tremendous way to increase uh, the prosperity of India. And this is led by the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, and then, of course, we have the uh, project, which is uh, to, uh, you know, I think the Swatch Budget project. Uh, and this is to eliminate uh, open defecation, input solid waste management, basically to create a clean, hygienic, healthy India. And this is led by the Ministry of Jal uh, Shakti. So these four projects uh, have been uh, also indicated in India's Vienna report at the UN as their primary means of achieving the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goal targets that have been set. However, I mean, this is a constant work in progress and, and uh, there was a SDG India index that was done and the dashboard uh, is available online. Uh, I've provided some links at the later slides for where you can view the data as well. Uh, but they actually measured the performance of the various states in India and sort of saw you know, where they were doing well and where intervention is needed. 
And you can see the bars in yellow and red are where intervention is needed, uh, where additional uh, action uh, is needed both by the public and private sector, uh, both the state and national level, uh, to be able to address uh, these specific goals. Uh, so I think in particular, the Indian government has come forward and said that uh, no poverty, zero hunger, and gender equality are three top priorities uh, for them, uh, which they would like to address. And so it also makes sense. And the reason why, why I'm sharing this information is because you know, uh, AI can be used to do many things. And if we wanted to address the sustainable development goals, the first question we have to ask is what problems are more important to address first? And I think the SDG framing that India has undertaken, uh, the reports that they have uh, put together and data they have collected uh, indicates that uh, these areas are what they want to focus on and in which we should look at where AI applications can move the needle. So how can AI address the sustainable development goals? Uh, essentially, there are four things that you can do. First is that uh, progress monitoring is really important because SDGs are fundamentally about measuring against certain targets and seeing what is the percentage improvement. And most of the targets are actually numerical uh, targets. Uh, so they will say, you know, how many percent get clean water access, how many percent of the population gets access to electrification and so on. So AI is used to help monitor progress, especially when you're getting data and reports coming in from all over the country, all across uh, the nation. Uh, and, and India, we know is such a diverse uh, place. Uh, even the languages are different in many of these states, uh, what they use. Um, so AI can help in monitoring the progress. Then secondly, AI can help predict outcomes, right? So for example, um, you know, if let's say a certain uh, a policy or something is, is undertaken, uh, what will the outcomes be? How will that help towards improving a particular indicator in the sustainable development goals? Uh, thirdly, you can also simulate the policy intervention. Uh, you can try various scenarios and see which scenario works better. Because oftentimes, uh, when we want to create policy, it's about making trade-offs. So making trade-offs uh, between you know, two or three or more competing issues. And uh, a simulation, which is powered by AI, can help you uh, decide better. And last but not least, uh, AI can help policymakers act upon the vast amount of structured and unstructured data. I think one of the remarkable things that the Indian government has done is basically digitize uh, much of its data. And, and it's a humongous uh, effort, uh, very extremely commendable. And um, because they have done that activity of digitizing, uh, now policymakers actually have a lot of structured and unstructured data that are digitized. And now the question is, you know, how do you act upon it? How do you use the data meaningfully? And AI can help you use that data meaningfully. So I want to share with you some examples of how AI and SDGs have been used, or rather AI has been used to address SDGs. And I'll be talking you through a couple of examples. Now, these examples, uh, so of course, I'm going to only share with you in brief, uh, but I've added uh, some links, uh, some source material uh, that you're welcome to search and Google later on and understand a bit more about the project itself. Uh, so this particular project is by the World Food Program. It is a, a particular uh, platform they call Hunger Map Life. And the thing the World Food Program is trying to do is they want to estimate uh, or monitor hunger, right? And, and, and nutrition uh, needs in a near real-time manner. See, the human body, right? Uh, they, they say, right, you, you can maybe last without water for about three days, but you can last without food for maybe about uh, two weeks and you cannot last without air, right? For more than, you know, a, a minute or so. Uh, so the thing is that having a certain sense of ability to understand and right, project demand over where famines might occur, over where it is food secure due to climate disasters and so on, it's extremely important, extremely helpful, and it will save lives because it allows targeted intervention, it allows food aid to be sent to those places. So how they do this is they use a computer assisted mechanism, uh, basically automated telephone calls to understand uh, what is the food situation on the ground in those specific locales. Now, this data obviously is collected in a rolling basis. So between the periods which they're collecting, uh, they essentially use a prediction model uh, based also on the weather pattern data and also on historical data such as uh, flooding risk, 
uh, you know, uh, insect activity and so on to understand where there might be crop failures, uh, where uh, uh, urgent needs for uh, food may arise. Uh, so this project is, is a very interesting one, uh, which they have used AI uh, in many aspects of it uh, to supplement their existing and, and build upon their ongoing data collection efforts. The next example I want to share with you is about kidney disease. So this example is from Singapore, and Singapore is a national socialized healthcare system. Uh, what that means is uh, uh, all of us in Singapore, we pay into a, uh, a national provident fund, and, and that uh, fund basically has a Medisafe or Medicare component, which you can use to pay for your hospital bills and so on. So essentially, the government has socialized healthcare to a large degree. And kidney disease is one of the long-term causes of hospitalization in Singapore. And uh, that's because um, kidney disease is particularly costly because uh, people with kidney disease can live for quite a while, but they will live poorly. And they will need dialysis about two to three times a week, or they will need insulin injections and so on. Uh, so the, uh, the situation also is that most people discover the kidney disease only when the problem happens. And so they find it really... Uh, uh, critical or almost a crisis when they actually find out their kidney disease and then instantly they have to be warded and they have to even consider whether they can get a transplant and so on. So it's really useful uh, to be able to predict hospitalization risk of a patient so that you can do early interventions and you can manage the disease before it becomes something to be hospitalized for. Uh, so this particular project was done between the national hospitals in Singapore. So Singapore again as um, I would say uh, autonomous hospital system. Uh, it is government-led but privatized healthcare system. Um, and they work with AI Singapore. AI Singapore is the national body uh, that basically looks after uh, or rather uh, leads all the AI initiatives from the government standpoint uh, in Singapore. And uh, what they did together was to build a prediction risk model. And you can see over here uh, how that works. Uh, essentially, you know, the idea is based on a patient's uh, medical information and also on the existing information on the past patient data and also on similar uh, patient data to that particular profile, they estimate you know, uh, what are the you know, hospitalization risks involved in a particular individual. And uh, knowing that they're able to target interventions. So this particular system is used to actually supplement the decision-making parameters for whether or not uh, they need to offer a certain treatment option or not. Uh, the third example I'll share with you is from Indonesia. And Jakarta has a super app, right, which is called Jati. Uh, it, it, it stands for something in the local vernacular. Uh, but it's an app that uh, was developed by the Smart Nation or Smart City Office. And initially, uh, it, it was basically about uh, helping citizens pay taxes, report municipal issues, find, uh, free Wi-Fi, uh, and, and more recently, perform contact tracing and so on. Now, what they've also done is that uh, once they created some utility around the app, they have used it to also create user-related data along things like where traffic congestion is happening, where there is a risk of flash flooding. So uh, flooding in Jakarta is a fairly regular occurrence and it's uh, very, very costly and it happens several times a year. Uh, and these are what we call flash floods. Uh, they, um, they, they sort of the area floods up in basically in about under three hours uh, very quickly uh, and then it dissipates after about 48 hours. Um, so this flash flooding means that you, know, you need actually on-ground data and you need to be able to use that to predict where new flash flooding might happen in a sequential form. Because if you have it in a particular area, uh, it tends to you know, uh, uh, move right, to a nearby area and then uh, create a, a flash flooding situation there as well. Uh, so they use the user generated data and then they build a sort of a, a prediction model on that and uh, understand where the risks are for flooding and also for other public safety issues such as terrorism. Um, so terrorist attacks have happened uh, several times in uh, Indonesia. And um, this is also used as a way to detect uh, where security forces may need to be quickly deployed or police may need to be quickly deployed in order to bring the situation into control. The next example is coming all the way from Brazil, right? Uh, so in Brazil, they spend 2% of their gross domestic product with the judiciary. Uh, this is an incredibly high figure uh, amount of money that's being spent with the judicial process. And so the Brazil Supreme Court understanding this, they created an AI system, which they call Victor. 
And the idea is, you know, how do you speed up the judicial process? How do you make it much more efficient? So a first thing they looked at was say that, you know, most of them, uh, the appeals process, how do we, you know, uh, speed up the appeals process? And so right now, every appeal that comes in needs to be evaluated against certain prerequisites, whether the appeal is even valid. Uh, we call this uh, triaging, right? It's like a medical triaging. In this case, you decide whether the appeal has any basic merits in the first place. Are all the documents in place? Are all the you know uh, uh, payments been made for the appeal? Uh, you know, and, and and have the lawyers and so on, uh, have the processors and all that been met? Uh, so this basic triaging uh, is done, uh, and the court clerks basically use this tool to supplement their effort. So right now, uh, from about forty seconds to do it manually, uh, Victor does it in five seconds. Uh, so per year in 2018, they had 50,000 appeals being filed, uh, which means that they saved about 33,000 in man hours. Uh, this is substantial, and uh, the aim is for the Supreme Court to actually extend the Victor system uh, to even the subnational courts as well, uh, so to improve the delivery of justice. I mean, I think we all know, right, that um, the laws can be there, but justice uh, delivered is justice delivered in time, right? justice served in time. Uh, so I think it's important to be able to deliver justice to the people uh, in time uh, and, and, and not, not take too long to do that. So that's what they did in Brazil. The next example comes from uh, Salesforce. So Salesforce basically built the AI economist. It's open source tool, which they built. And they use reinforcement learning as a way to help uh, simulate tax policy design. So in tax policy, it's typically between several trade-offs. Uh, and in this case, they pick the trade-off of productivity and equality. And uh, because on one hand, uh, you want to tax such that there is uh, equality, uh, so that you get income equality, so that you can make sure that social services are well-funded and supported. But at the same time, you don't want there to be so much tax to the point that productivity suffers. Uh, those who are job creators, those who are investors or companies decide they don't want to engage anymore because the uh, tax is too high, right? So it is a balance. It is a balance, a trade-off. And the thing is that the economy is not static. The economy is evolving as well. It is uh, growing, it's shrinking, and so on. So how do you uh, derive a tax policy uh, that is uh, well-suited to several circumstances? So in this case, the simulation model basically tried to uh, mimic this. And of course, the basic model, but the idea essentially is to is to understand you know, how uh, this whole thing might, might come together. And so um, that's what that particular project was about. Uh, it's a project in its early stages, but it's something that uh, they're working with several uh, governments to basically figure out uh, where uh, such a, a mechanism can be used to figure out policy options. The, I believe, final example of here, right, is on trusted data sharing. And I think one of the things, uh, I think earlier, uh, uh, I think Mr. Vinay, I'm, sure, I'm not sure who was sharing about the data sharing uh, and the importance of that uh, in, in India. Uh, but similarly, in Singapore as well, the government agencies collect a lot of data, both structured and unstructured, uh, but they find it challenging to share with each other for a variety of different reasons. Um, and, and some of the reasons have to do with the fact that, you know, two departments may collect the same kind of data. And so the issue becomes whose data is considered more accurate, right? So there are issues around that. Uh, then the second kind of issue that comes up is, um, you know, will, when I share my data with another department, will the data be secure? If the data somehow leaks out, you know, the political impact of that will come back to me. So I don't really want to share my data. Uh, so that becomes a second issue as well. So there's a lot of issues around trust, uh, around security, around, you know, having a, a framework, a common framework. So a common framework, is what is needed in these cases to basically uh, figure out uh, what's the best way to share data between uh, different agencies, different organizations. And so they developed the data sharing framework and also built the internal one-stop portal, which they call Vault. Uh, and this is to help uh, any public officer, any public servant uh, to discover for. So, so you don't just have to request things that you already know, but you can discover what's actually available out there. Uh, you can also request and you can access the particular data. And uh, this data uh, basically is done in a way that uh, the data has a particular digital uh, fingerprint uh, so that you know uh, in the case of uh, any misuse of data, you know where that came from or who you know, that data was given to and, and, 
and how that was ended up being misused. Uh, so there's a digital fingerprint that is created, all data that's being downloaded as well. Uh, but it's, it's a fairly sophisticated initiative uh, and I shouldn't spend too much time on it right now, uh, but uh, please look it up uh, on the government architecture uh, in Singapore and how they have structured their ideas around that. So to, to wrap up, you know, so I think when we're looking at SDGs and so on, a couple of key considerations for governments in general is that there's a lot of SDG targets. Uh, it's important to start with where intervention is most needed. Um, I think earlier we have seen uh, what the Indian government has already put forward as their important areas for intervention and also what the data shows in terms of where progress still needs to be made. Secondly is that AI is enabled by data, which means that the philosophy around information and data needs to shift. Uh, most of us are used, especially in government service, to a philosophy that we will keep the data and then we will decide who gets it. Uh, but I think that philosophy needs some updating and we need to proceed to a sharing. But of course, for that sharing to happen, the policy and process must be in place. You know, sharing won't just happen because of wishful thinking. Uh, we have to make sure that people are incentivized uh, to continually generate, uh, organize, share, and also protect data from misuse. Uh, because there are bad state actors uh, who, in gotten hold of the data, will do uh, nasty things with it. Uh, so we have to be careful and be mindful of, of how data can be used. Uh, uh, second last thing would be that uh, pilot projects are crucial in order to build confidence. A lot of times when they started some of these projects, the ground staff were rather uh, unhappy, right? As in the case of the Victor project in Brazil, because they thought that the judiciary is trying to reduce the amount of manpower required uh, and wanted to downsize. And so they got really worried and they decided, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of resistance in the respect. Uh, but uh, taking the approach of, of showing a simple pilot project and how AI augmentation uh, can improve the efficiency performance of uh, civil servants, I think is extremely powerful uh, in order to convert the skepticism. And last but not least is that Investment in talent infrastructure has to happen as well, alongside uh, policy and processes, right? Because uh, fundamentally, if you want to reap the full benefits, uh, we have to build infrastructure for it, uh, and the talent must be available to be able to make meaningful use of data or the information in order to benefit the country and society. Uh, so with that, I want to maybe leave with you some learning resources that you can take a look at uh, in order to extend your knowledge and expand it in the area of sustainable development goals and artificial intelligence. Um, so um, I, I come to the end of our presentation and maybe I, I'm not sure uh, how much time we have left, uh, but um, Swati, over to you. Thanks, Mr. Swaminathan. We're good on time. And um, really, your use cases were, um, they were insightful, they were well chosen and um, spread across breadth of sectors. And I can see how much our audience is uh, interested in your uh, presentation. They're all asking uh, for your presentation. So thank you so much. I'm sure uh, we can draw a lot from what uh, you have uh, shared with us today. And definitely, you know, we can uh, implement some of those uh, for our, um, uh, you know, uh, key sectors going forward. With that, um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, part of the uh, show today. It's been some time now that, uh, you know, you've all been uh, patiently listening to our speakers and with such interest as I can see. Uh, and I'm sure you're having a very good time learning. Um, we're going to pause for a short moment here now and re-energize ourselves. So I'm going to request you all to please sit back and relax and uh, engage yourself in a little fun activity, some gamification learning. And uh, I'm going to invite Ms. Ambika. She's our Intel AI for Youth coach. And she is going to uh, take you all through some fun AI experiments. Go ahead, Ambika. Thank you, Swati. Um, good, afternoon, good evening. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I believe uh, you all must be having great fun in this session. And you must have learned a lot about how to implement AI for social impact, social good. And uh, a lot of insights you have already gained about the sustainable development goals, which is why I'm going to take you through a short quiz, which is again about sustainable development goals. Here, you can test your knowledge about the SDGs that uh, concerns you the most. 
and also since it's a it's sort of a quiz competition you can see who is going to win okay so this quiz we are going to have on the kahoot platform and uh, i'll be sharing the uh, link as well as code to you all uh, just one second you all need to go to kahoot.it and you have to type this code which i'm mentioning in the chat as soon as you go to the link and you uh, enter the code you will be asked to put a name and once you put the name your name would appear on this screen great so let's wait for 2 minutes for everyone to um, get enrolled in the quiz and in the meantime let me tell you a bit about this competition here you will have around 10 questions uh, which pertain to several sustainable development goals each of these questions uh, would be either uh, an objective one or a true false statement you have to select the correct answer in the least possible time so the one who has most correct answers and the minimum amount of time taken would be leading in the quiz okay we already have 29 oh 32 participants that is amazing we can see a lot of fun names also okay i would request all of you to be a part of this quiz Seventy-five participants. Ninety, great. So, if you have missed on the message of code, the code is there on screen as well. You can take a look at that. Hundred and five participants. Just uh, again. Okay. I think we can begin now. Start button will appear once I begin the quiz from here. Okay, great. Let's begin. Those who are still trying to log in, you all can uh, log into the quiz even in between the quiz. Okay? Let's start. Okay, here's the first question. How can you tell that someone is living in poverty? There are four options. Select the option which you think is the correct answer.
Sajid sir, it's seven two six nine four one three, not two three. Twenty eight correct answers. The person is not able to fulfill their basic needs. Absolutely. Let's see who is in the leaderboard. V S on top, then Rachi, M T A S and Money. You all still have a chance to come up in the leaderboard. Let's go to the next question. Fewer girls than boys attend school worldwide. True or false? Okay, 84 correct answers. That's great. Yeah, let's see the leaderboard. It has changed. MT is now on top. Then Rachi, AS, VS and Kapi. Let's go to the next question. What percentage of researchers in science and technology are women? Ambika, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you, thank you, sir. So I was saying 30% is the correct answer. 37 people have marked it correctly. Um, if you want to check, you can also go to the Sustainable Development Goals website and read about all these facts. So yeah, let's see the scoreboard. MD has uh, maintained their position with AS on second, Kapi third, Anirban fourth, and AG fifth. Let's go to the next question. Fourth question, portable water is, select the correct answer. But it could be there on your screen. If you are unable to uh, read them, maybe you can reload it. Sixty-three correct answers. Water that is safe to drink. Right. Absolutely correct. And the leaderboard remains the same. Let's go to the next question. What does energy efficiency mean? Correct answers. A device or building that uses relatively little energy to provide power. That is meant by energy efficiency. Okay, let's see how many of you got it right. The leaderboard has drastically changed. Dark Knight is second, Bob the Builder is third, Giraj, Giraj Goyal is fourth, and AS on fifth. Let's move to the next question. True or false? Everyone has access to electricity. That should not be difficult. People are answering in the chat also. That's good. Okay, that is great. We have around 80 correct answers. And 16 still think that everyone has access to electricity. So yeah, let's see the leaderboard. Remains the same. Next question, seventh. To reduce health inequalities, all children should have access to
91 correct answers. All of the above, clean and drinking water, vaccines, and medical care. Absolutely right. So, okay. VS is now in top five. Let's see the next question. Eight. Who is in charge of looking after the planet? Okay, 80 people say everyone, 11 people say only scientists, one says famous people, and three say government officials. But everyone is in charge of looking after the planet. Let's see, the leaderboard has not changed. Let's go to the next question. Ninth, what percentage of all these species living in the ocean have been identified? This might be a bit tricky. Okay. Twenty seven correct answers. Uh, around five percent. There still exists more than ninety five percent species which are yet to be identified. And that's pretty fascinating. Okay, the leaderboard has changed. Dark Knight on top, Bob the Builder, second, AS third, MT fourth, and then Rachi. Let's move to the next question. That is the final one. Who should be involved in partnerships to achieve the 17 SDGs? People are being quick. Ninety-three correct answers. All of the above. Citizens, governments, companies, everyone has to collaborate, everyone has to partner to achieve these 17 sustainable development goals. Absolutely right. And now it's time for us to see who are the top three participants who won the quiz. So on third position, we have AS with 8157 points. Bob the Builder second. And first, any guesses? Dark Knight with 8,433 points and 10 on 10 answers. Uh, awesome. I request all of you to share your scores and your positions in the chat box so that we know. And please, Dark Knight, Bob the Builder and AS, reveal yourselves. I hope the quiz was interesting for you all and you got to know a bit more about Sustainable Development Goals. And with this, uh, we now move back to the main session. Swati, back to you. Ambika, thank you so much. Um, it was fun. It was aging. It was hands-on. And you made learning a lot of fun. And especially thanks to our audience. We had such good participation. You made it, uh, uh, you know, today's, uh, this, uh, this uh, what do you say, this uh, poll, this uh, quiz that we did, you made it so participative. So thanks so much for that. With that, we are going to move on to our uh, next session. Now, the next session is uh, going to be about understanding poverty in the Philippines with AI. So for this, I'm going to request our eminent speaker and UNDP representative, uh, Ms. Runabel Reyes, to talk about a successful AI use case, which has been adopted in Philippines, to understand and tackle poverty. Ms. Runabel Reyes is the chief technical advisor of the UNDP Philippines Painting Lab. She's also an associate professor at the National Institute of Physics of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, where she heads the data and computation research group. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Swati. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here, uh, to be invited to share 
our um, use case for understanding poverty in the Philippines using AI. So I'm um, sharing my screen. Uh, let me present it. Can you okay. I can see. Great. Thank you. Um, so we had a great introduction from the earlier speaker and um, showed different um, use cases for addressing um, sustainable development goals uh, with AI technologies. And for this session, we'll deep dive into one particular uh, use case addressing the first sustainable development goal of reaching no poverty. Now, in the Philippines, uh, 20, almost 21% live on less than uh, $3.20 uh, a day in 2019. So still a long way to go to, um, uh, to, to achieving uh, no poverty. Uh, but a uh, multi-stakeholder course uh, effort including international and humanitarian uh, organizations and the Philippine government um, and, um, and, and communities themselves are working together uh, to uplift families from this extreme poverty. And to identify <clears throat> the most vulnerable communities um, and to monitor their progress is one of the uh, problems that this, use, this um, AI use case is uh, seeking to solve. And with uh, this AI-assisted decision-making, organizations will be able to uh, identify the most vulnerable areas through high-resolution maps, uh, such uh, as shown here, for targeted humanitarian aid, targeted interventions for um, for wealth and also other types of access, just access to uh, connectivity, clean water, electricity, and such. And of course, the data that's uh, that's generated here, the maps generated here, uh, can be used for research and overlaying, cross-analyzing with other uh, data sets um, to, to deepen our understanding and inform our decisions as we um, uh, as we address these um, challenges. So in the past uh, several years, many uh, studies have been um, published looking at uh, using satellite images uh, and machine learning um, to, in, in particular, deep learning and transfer learning to uh, predict poverty. Uh, using um, yeah, uh, the features that are seen using satellite images. Um, um, for example, uh, you can see uh, road in, uh, networks, uh, infrastructure buildings um, that are indicative of um, develop, more developed regions versus uh, uh, less developed regions. And these were, these were shown to be um, shown to be effective. Um, and also uh, inter, uh, a good use case for using um, for using AI for um, addressing the uh, 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 poverty uh, SDG. Um, for this work, what we um, uh, innovated on uh, is uh, is uh, in in the approach to this uh, to this problem. So the question is, can we use uh, combined geospatial data that are uh, publicly available uh, and open to predict poverty um, with the same high resolution with the same high resolution um, using um, uh, using data that does not um, require purchasing uh, satellite images. So this uh, would lead to a more uh, uh, low cost solution and also one that can be um, that can be updated more regularly. Um, and it uses a, a variety of uh, inputs from um, satellite images, in particular night light, nighttime lights, um, nighttime lights data um, from uh, NASA, uh, social media data, and um, other open source public data. 
uh, we'll we'll go through the detailed uh, data sets also uh, uh, later. Um, but the um, uh, key data set here is actually um, an official uh, survey data from uh, conducted by the Philippine Statistics uh, Authority, which is the 2017 Demographic and Health Survey that contains so social economic indicators related to asset ownership, education, health, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, and combination of these um, gives uh, gives a wealth index, which is the primary indicator of social economic well-being. And that was done for uh, more than 1,000 household clusters uh, across the Philippines. And this is uh, um, the, 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 uh, the indicator that we would like to, um, that we will predict for uh, the whole country. So, uh, so that's the, um, the, um, the key uh, essential idea um, that we can use uh, machine learning using data that we know, uh, data that we have for these specific clusters, um, combined with um, another set of um, geospatial uh, input data that correlate, correlates with this wealth index, uh, model that relationship, and use that to um, use that to predict um, the uh, wealth index for the rest of the country. So in a way, we're filling in the gaps um, and addressing also the gaps in, in, in data by uh, using this uh, machine learning technique. So um, the model uses uh, these particular uh, input data sets uh, as, as, as as I mentioned earlier, from uh, these are different geospatial data from uh, satellites or remote sensing, in particular nighttime lights, um, NDVI vegetation index, land and land surface temperature. Then there's data from social media, particularly Facebook marketing API, which gives us the percentage of households with 4G, 3G, 2G, and or Wi-Fi connection, or if they don't have it. And um, there's also a uh, device uh, information on the device, Apple or Android, and some consumer preferences. And then a uh, set of data, uh, data sets for uh, points of interest, where, um, uh, of course, the op open street map um, is the uh, open source uh, data set on the um, um, different um, um, stores, uh, um, government um, facilities, healthcare facilities, and roads uh, across the, uh, across the country, uh, and in particular, uh, and uh, to augment that, we also use uh, um, a school data set, a school locations uh, data set from Check My School, which is a civil society organization that is mapping uh, the, the health, uh, the, sorry, the education uh, education facilities in the country. And the Department of Health also has registry data that shows uh, where the healthcare facilities are. Uh, some points of interest that are uh, used are number of banks, schools, hospitals, uh, golf courses, cinemas, bars, hotels, parks, and other uh, uh, yeah, retail, um, uh, retail locations uh, in each uh, area is um, calculated and, and used as, 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 as an input. So all these um, uh, different um, indicators are are fed into um, a regression model. In particular, what after testing different models, different algorithms, uh, the one that was selected and that we that 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 is uh, recommended for use for deployment is the run is a random forest regression model. Uh, it was one of the uh, algorithms that that was. Uh, uh, enumerated earlier, a regression model gives you uh, allows you to predict a numerical um, numerical indicators. In this case, are social economic indicators, including the wealth index. Um, and so, in this case, instead of uh, predicting something to happen in the future, 
it's predicting uh, what the value is of the, what the wealth index wealth indices are for these areas where um, we did not conduct the survey um, because of course of um, uh, resource limitations we cannot conduct the survey for all areas in this case uh, and so we're using the regression model to predict the wealth index for these uh, all other areas in the Philippines uh, where there's no survey but where this big data this open source um, geospatial indicators are available so that we can um, um, fill in um, the map. Uh, and noting here that um, because of the uh, um, the open open uh, nature of the data, the uh, this method has a significantly lower cost of development and rollout, uh, and also because um, of the nature of the regression. Uh, the random forest regression, regression model, uh, the model is more interpretable because uh, as we'll show later, we know which indicators are most um, impacting the socioeconomic indicators that we are predicting. And uh, yeah, that, that, that remark is also um, usually um, 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 uh, uh, said relative to uh, the black box nature of the uh, deep learning models where it's harder to interpret which parts of the features in the satellite images, for example, are um, contributing to your uh, predict the variable that you're trying to predict. So now showing the, the, the results. Um, so in this upper uh, right chart, we see um, the result of the model, uh, which is the predicted wealth index, plotted against the actual wealth index uh, for those uh, for, for those clusters where we have the actual uh, data, uh, and this shows that there's a uh, good um, correspondence between uh, the actual values and the predicted values, indicating um, that the model is uh, uh, performing well. Uh, quantitatively, we sh we show here in the table the R squared um, value, or the which says uh, that the model um, is able to explain 66% of the variance uh, in the wealth index um, using these uh, um, geospatial indicators as input, uh, and that that compares well with the uh, with the model that uses the satellite, uh, high resolution satellite images and deep learning, uh, which gave an R squared of 0.63, uh, which is yeah, even slightly lower than 0.66. So they are uh, actually uh, performing comparably well. So this is the um, main result. Um, of course, we can also see here that if we use only some of the data, like POI data only, remote sensing data only, social media data only, we don't get as high uh, an R squared or as good a uh, model performance, but combining them together, we actually get a pretty good model. And on the right, we have um, the map of the estimated uh, wealth. Now, uh, for uh, an 18 square kilometer uh, granularity, that's the size of each uh, grid here, um, colored from um, green to red as you go, uh, yeah, green to red, with the highest to the lowest uh, wealth index. And that um, maps um, well with the, with the actual wealth index or the ground truth um, that's not as granular, um, but um, is based on the survey um, results uh, shown here on, on the right. So um, yeah, that the, the takeaway is that the model can, um, um, can um, learn from the the patterns uh, from the actual data, and that the the and the um, the different geospatial indicators that were selected are a, are able to um, um, are able to um, capture um, the wealth index across areas, and the model is able then to um, project that to these uh, more granular. Um, locations across the country. Um, 
no that's the main that's the main result with the wealth in with the wealth index as the uh, uh, variable being predicted or in 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 machine learning language the target variable um looking at other social economic indicators as the target variable uh, we find actually that the model are uh, does less well or does more yeah, does does less well um so we, as we see in the in these plots and in the r squared values that are lower um for the in, uh, indicator whether the proportion of households that are uh, with the toilet fitted outside with the clean water source and with a high uh, with an educational uh, attainment um the predicted and actual values uh, are less um, no, tightly tightly correlated. So this indicates that um, this uh, particular set of um, indicators um, and the model are not enough yet to capture um, uh, these uh, socioeconomic indicators, um, which just means that, of course, that we could um, enrich the model with more specific, perhaps, uh, input uh, data that can map uh, better with these uh, particular socioeconomic indicators that are of course related to other um, to the addressing other so sustainable development goals. Now looking at um, the high resolution map um, uh, with just two uh, examples highlighted here, one region in um, in Palawan, the, the island of Palawan um, has, um, as you can see here, has a low, uh, lower, relatively lower wealth index, and that's um, reflected in the different um, um, indicators here. Uh, there are no banks, no restaurants, uh, no population with 4G access. Uh, there's 25% with 3G access and 25% with Wi-Fi access and a low nighttime luminosity index. Uh, in contrast, we select um, uh, a relatively um, higher wealth index um, location uh, here in urban, uh, in the capital city of Metro Manila in Marikina City. Um, um, we see that that's all reflected in Know, uh, having banks, restaurants, uh, people with 4G access um, versus 3G, more people with 4G versus 3G, um, with Wi Fi, and then a high nighttime luminosity because of the um, economic activity in the area. Uh, and, um, and this particular um, yeah, um, high uh, resolution. Um, High resolution map would be um, uh, available now because uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, performed over the whole Philippines. Uh, and now, as alluded to earlier, we can interpret the model by looking at the feature, the, fe uh, the features or the input data. So, in machine learning uh, parlance, they're called um, features. Uh, in particular, here. Uh, we use the Shapley ad additive explanations, or SHAP for short, which is uh, a technique based on game theory that tells you uh, that 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 shows like in the plot here um, what happens when you add a variable to the model, um, and that tells you the impact of that variable or that that feature uh, in the model. In this case, the wider the spread of the variable, the more impact it has. And the colors show whether it's positively correlated with wealth index or negatively correlated. And for this particular uh, model, the finding is that the, the features with the highest impact are the nighttime light uh, index, uh, the proportion of population with 4G access. So in a way, um, looking at uh, electrification and uh, connectivity, and the percentage of schools with water. So um, edu uh, access to, to water utilities uh, have the biggest impact. And uh, these are positively correlated as one would expect, brighter areas and 
a high percentage of 4G users and schools with water indicate a higher wealth index. So this yeah, tells us that the model sort of um, um, the model yeah, captures what we expected to capture uh, and does that in a, in a quantitatively um, 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 uh, in a quantitatively sound way. Of course, there are limitations um, and um, in particular completeness of data is a real uh, challenge uh, that we have face here in the Philippines. Uh, even for OSM, uh, OpenStreetMap and Facebook, uh, the, as you can see here for OSM, the completeness of the data availability varies largely across the country and in a way also varies with the with the development index or wealth index in particular areas um, also as noted earlier it is the model uh, is not uh, is not able to um, have good performance in predicting other socioeconomic indicators and the challenge there is to um, to access and use other representative surveys uh, that are um, yeah that, that are performed by the national statistics office to augment the uh, the input data uh, to see when uh, how much the model could improve uh, in uh, predicting these other social economic indicators. So uh, to sum up, uh, the uh, question we set out with is: Can we use unconventional data sources to infer? Socioeconomic indicators in a in a in a robust sound way, uh, and the uh, initial results show that a model using these uh, different geospatial data from various sources uh, is able actually to perform as well as a deep learning approach uh, using high resolution satellite images, and this method can uh, offers uh, lower cost and richer insights to the people who will use them without sacrifice sacrificing performance. So um, that um, sums up our um, use case. Um, thank you for the uh, for the time again, and um, I'm flashing here my uh, uh, details, contact details. So happy to um, to connect and then uh, have any questions. And of course, I believe um, we may have time to address questions here as well. Uh, thank you, and uh, we'll turn it back over to. The moderator. Thanks very much, Ms. Fares. Thanks very much for this uh, wonderful and informative session. In fact, your session is going to be the guiding light for, uh, uh, you know, for driving us towards the no poverty SDG objective. So thanks once again. Uh, with this, it's time for us to conclude today's session. And I believe you all enjoyed listening to our eminent speakers as they share their learnings and experiences with us and hope we'll see you all again in the next session. With this, I'm going to invite Dr. Alok Goel. Sir, you are a Senior General Manager uh, for the Capacity Building at NEGD, that is National League Governance Division. I would request you, sir, to give away the closing remarks. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, uh, Swarthi. Uh, and uh, very good afternoon to uh, one and all. Uh, respected uh, Shri uh, Vinay Thakur sir, uh, Shri uh, Saurabh Gaur, Ms. Uh, Rena Reis, uh, Mr. Virappan Swaminathan and dear participants and August gathering of uh, ladies and gentlemen. I feel privileged uh, to present the concluding remark and vote of thanks. At the outset, I would like to thank honorable speakers, uh, Shri Saurabh Gaur, uh, Ms. Uh, Rena Reis, uh, Mr. Virappan Swaminathan, who graced the occasion with their uh, presence and addressed the August gathering with very insightful and inspiring speeches. We are extremely grateful to all of you for uh, sparing your valuable time and sharing your rich experience uh, on the topic AI uh, for social good and how AI can be a dependable tool and uh, coupled with uh, SDG goals uh, and referring to uh, different uh, scenarios and how it can be uh, used for uh, poverty alleviation. And my, I must express uh, my deep sense of uh, appreciation to the entire UNDP and Intel team uh, for, uh, uh, for putting up dedicated efforts 
and uh, for making the event successful. Uh, as you know that this is the sixth workshop in the series and I would like to express uh, special uh, gratitude to Ms. Um, uh, Shweta Khurana, uh, Saloni Singhal and entire Intel, Intel team for their constant support. And uh, I would also like to thank all the team members from NEGD, my colleagues, Ruchi Aroda, Parul, uh, Barnali ma'am, uh, entire uh, ANC team, Mr. Shilo from LMS team, Mr. Firoz and uh, one new uh, and special member in our team, Mr. Rakshansh, for their tireless efforts and uh, continued support. And yes, we welcome uh, Swati uh, Sani in the team from Intel. And a special thanks and gratitude to our CEO, Sir uh, Shri Abhishek Singh and uh, Shri Vinay Thakur, uh, Sir, for their continued guidance and support for making this event uh, uh, so enriching and successful. And we look forward for many more uh, valuable sessions uh, in this series. And last but not the least, special thanks to our audience for showing keen interest in Digital India Dialogue for their active participation uh, during the program. And uh, a big congratulations to all the winners uh, of the quiz. So uh, uh, in the end, I would like to take this opportunity to apprise you uh, for the uh, new participants who joined the event today that Digital India Dialogue is one such platform where contributors and takers create a a uh, fruitful association and uh, this digital India dialogue integrates the resources and connects the dot and tries to bring in the right mix of experts, content and audience in the context of capacity building for all the stakeholders. And uh, I would urge all of you to please keep on visiting our NEGD website www.negd.gov.in for the updates for upcoming uh, sessions of uh, digital India dialogue and many more capacity building programs being offered by NEGD that you might be interested in. So thank you all with the request uh, to all the participants uh, to please share your valuable feedbacks and input uh, on the feedback link, which will be uh, which we will be sharing with you soon. And also we will be sharing a, a poll with you uh, for uh, taking your opinion. So uh, a big thank you to all of you. Thank you. So thanks very much. Indeed, uh, uh, our, our participants have made it uh, very special, very engaging. They have set the bars very high. And uh, thanks so much for this. Um, with that, I'm just going to request all of you. We have uh, shared a feedback link in the chat uh, room as well. In the chat message, you can see. And if you can take two minutes to fill this feedback form, it will really help us uh, you know, to make the upcoming sessions even more enriching for all of you. Thanks a lot once again.